Good evening and welcome. Thank you very much for joining tonight. I am very happy to see you. I hope everything's going well and you had a nice day today. I got a chance to see a rainbow just a few minutes ago. That's always nice. I like seeing rainbows. So, all right. Good evening. So it's a little early, but we have a lot of people here. So why don't we just get started? All right. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Glory to thee, our God, glory to thee. O heavenly King, O comforter, the spirit of truth, who are in all places and fillest all things. I treasure your blessings and the giver of life. Come and abide in us, cleanse us from every stain, and save our souls, O gracious Lord. Holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal, have mercy on us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. O Holy Trinity, have mercy on us. Lord, cleanse us from our sins. Master, pardon our iniquities. Holy God, visit and heal our infirmities for thy name's sake. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. All right, so good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for joining me tonight. As always, I don't have any um, special questions that um, have been asked at this point. So if you do have any questions, please feel free to put them in the live chat or you can uh, email or, well, preferably text me um, those questions. But uh, since I don't have any questions this morning, we're going to plow on ahead with the Gospel of Mark. Let me open this drawer so that I can just put the Bible right in front of me. One second. And there we go. Okay, so we are in the Gospel of Mark. We are very close to the conclusion of the Gospel of Mark. We have gone through a number of things. I think we did talk about his crucifixion, but I think we'll revisit that because it's one of the most important things that we have in our Christian faith. Okay, and like I said, if you do have any questions, I would love to have um, some questions, so I'll be more than happy to answer anything you might have. Okay, all right. So we're going to take a look at, um, we are on um, page 1355 of the Orthodox Study Bible. We are in Mark 15, chapter 15, verse 21. Okay, so here we go. Then they compelled a certain man, Simon, a Cyrenian, the father of Alexander and Rufus, as he was coming out of the country and passing by to bear his cross. And they brought him to a place, to the place Golgotha, which is translated place of a skull. And they gave him wine mingled with myrrh to drink, but he did not take it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments, casting lots for them to determine what every man should take. Now it was about the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of his accusation was written above, saying, The King of the Jews. With him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and the other on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And he was numbered with the transgressors. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking among themselves with the scribes, said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross, that we may see and believe. Even those who were crucified with him reviled him. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about something, but I need a prop, and I don't know if I have a prop. Yes, I do. Look at that. Okay. So that. Now, I can't recall if you can see this normally or in mirror image, but I want you to pay close attention to that cross. Okay. It's the Orthodox cross. Well, one depiction of the Orthodox cross. So, of course, we have the bars right here for where Jesus is crucified. 
we have the upper bar, which is where the inscription was. And then we have the slanted bar. Now that serves two purposes. The first purpose is to demonstrate that crucifixion was meant to take a while. And I think I talked a little bit about this in the past. And I don't want to belabor the point. But the other thing it points out, because it's crooked, the high side is the thief we would call the good thief. And then the low side is the bad thief. The good thief is the one who says um, that we are justly dying, but this man has done no wrong. And then he turns to Jesus and says, remember me when you go into your kingdom. And Jesus says, most assuredly, I tell you that you will um, today be in paradise with me. Okay, so that is um, the good thief, and that's the high side of where that cross bar goes. And then the low side is the, the thief who continues to revile Jesus. Now, um, we're not going to get into Mel Gibson's movie either, but obviously he has really horrible things happen to the um, bad thief, and the good thief, of course, goes to paradise and so forth. So that's why the Orthodox cross is shaped the way that it is. It's shaped that way um, to show which was the good thief and which was the bad thief. Okay. All right, so, and um, just again to remind you, it's Jesus's right side. So from the perspective, from Jesus looking outward, the thief on this side is the good thief and the thief on that side is the bad, a bad thief. So that's why the cross is slanted the way that it is. Okay, so continuing on. Now, when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of those who stood by when they heard that said, look, he is calling for Elias. Then someone ran and filled a sponge full of sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink, saying, let him alone. Let us see if Elias will come and take him down. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. Then the veil of the temple was torn from, torn into from top to bottom. So when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last said, truly this man was the son of God. We believe that to be Cornelius, the great centurion, oh, excuse me, not Cornelius. The centurion is a Gentile our tradition knows him as St. Longinus. I always thought it was Cornelius. St. Longinus, L-O-N-G-I-N-O-S, Longinus. Okay, so that's our tradition. All right, continuing on. There were also some women looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James the Less, and of Joseph, and Salome. trying to see if there's anything interesting about the footnote, who followed him and ministered to him when he was in Galilee, and many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. Now, when the evening had come, because it was the day of preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking courage, went into Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And Pilate marveled, that he was already dead, and summoning the centurion, he asked him if he were dead for some time. So when he found out from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph, and then he bought a fine linen and took him down and wrapped him in the linen. And he laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out of the rock, and rolled a stone against the door of the tomb, and Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, had served where he was laid. Okay, so Mark gives an account of a couple of the myrrh-bearing women. Okay, Mary Magdalene, we know her from the account. She was the woman who um, Christ removed demons from, and she anointed his feet with her hair. We also know um, James the Less is one of the disciples. There are three Jameses in New Testament accounting, or well, probably more than that, but the three major ones. Was James, the brother of our Lord, who actually was never a disciple. He received a vision of Christ resurrected from the dead. I mean, he had an appearance of Christ. Um, that comes in the Gospel of Luke, I believe. 
but he was never a disciple. But then again, you have James, the son of Zebedee, right? James and John, the son of Zebedee. And then you have James, the son of Alphaeus or James the lesser. So Mary is the wife of Alphaeus. You can just sort of put those two together. Okay, so let's go on. Um, 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 empty tomb, chapter 16. Here we are, almost to the end of the Gospel of Mark. Now, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome, those three, the ones that were at the foot of the cross, are now here. Um, bought spices that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. I like the rising of the sun. Different translation. And they said among themselves, who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? But when they looked up, they saw that the, t the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who is crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they have laid him. But go and tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. And there you will see him as he said to you. So they quickly went and fled from the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Now, this particular reading is the reading that we do in the Orthodox Church when we are outside during Pascha. Pascha night, we've done the procession and we've come back and we're in front of the door going back into the church. And we read a gospel. This is it. It's also known as the second Aothanon, which is um, one of 11 readings that are done during the service of great matins. Okay. There are other readings that are done in other times of the year, but there are 11 selections that are generally read in succession from one to 11 during Sunday morning Orthro services. Okay. And that reading is a resurrectional reading. So, for example, we have this one, which is the second one, not the first one, but the second one. But then we also have um, the reading of the story of Emmaus, you know, the two uh, Luke and Cleopas walking towards Emmaus. And there are many others um, from all the various gospels just giving an account of Christ's resurrection. So uh, this is the one, though. It's beautiful, first of all. I prefer the RSV version. This is uh, a uh, the New King James Bible. But... It's, it's beautiful, and we say it every year. Even this year, we said it, even though we couldn't go outside. And uh, although it was me and two subdeacons. God willing, next year will be different. Inshallah. Okay, so continuing on. So now we've already had the reading of the Athenon, so here's the next thing. Now, when he rose... Early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. Hmm, I just said that. He went and told those who had been with, she went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. After that, he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country. Ha ha, Luke and Cleopas. And they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Later, he appeared to the eleven as they sat at table, and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, not just people, by the way, every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. 
And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Amen. So that's it for the Gospel of Mark. Interesting things about that. And we saw the Luke and Cleopas thing. But we also have this whole idea of being able to handle snakes and and laying hands on the sick and drinking poison things and not suffering and so forth. Um, I don't know what to make of that. I mean, obviously it's there, but I also know, um, you know, there are snake handlers now and, you know, they can handle snakes sometimes and sometimes they get bitten and die. Um, I, I still think it comes down to the fact that we really should not put God to the test. There's a reason why he says this here. And that reason absolutely has nothing to do with just being Superman or Superwoman. It has to do with the mission that you have while you're here on earth. There are things for you to do while you're here preaching the gospel. And those things are not just showing off. So I don't think it's just a matter of saying, well, because I believe I'm going to play with this snake. I think that's actually really faulty logic. So... You know, the, the, the signs of Christian faith have changed rather pointedly, I think, over the years. Now the signs of Christian faith have more to do with the fruits of the labors that someone does rather than just um, miraculous things that they're able to do that they couldn't do before. So anyway, that's just my speculation. But that's one of the things that I think we need to pay attention to is to not become overly um, focused, if you will, on, um, you know, the miraculous things that happen in people's activities, you know, walking on water or healing, um, you know, the sick or even raising the dead or so forth. Okay. So, no, this is not the one. Sorry, I'm trying to find my next Bible. Okay, so if anyone has any questions, this is a great time to ask them. If you have any questions at all, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. So please feel free to ask. Otherwise, I'm just finding the index here. Uh, it's going to take a few minutes. I don't really care about that. Hold on one second. Sorry. Okay, there we go. Now we're looking for, okay, all right. All right, the next thing that we're going to read is Micah. Micah is found in the Orthodox Study Bible, the new version, immediately following the prophecy of Amos. And... It is found on page 1004. Okay, so you can look along with me. Again, the prophecy of Micah. So let's talk a little bit about its background. I'm just again reading from the Orthodox Study Bible. Don't be overly impressed. This isn't from memory or anything. So Micah is commemorated on August 14th in the Orthodox Church. So we just passed his commemoration. We believe that Micah prophesied from 740 to 686 BC. And that is the majority of the book that he wrote was written before 720 BC. And basically the major theme is God's destruction of evildoers and his goodness to the faithful. It says in the midst of a very dark time, Micah delivers the messianic prophecies of hope and deliverance for the faithful remnant. We'll talk about that in a second. He foretells the new covenant, the incarnation, Christ's birth at Bethlehem, Christ's suffering and the church and its persecutions, conversion of the Gentiles, and a time of peace. Faithful remnant, that's an important phrase. The faithful remnant is a collection of people who continued to hold on to the faith, even though the people around them weren't holding on to the faith. Because you have to remember that once they get into the promised land, they have a time of relative prosperity when King David and King Solomon and so forth are there ruling over them. But then very soon after Solomon, the, the two countries, Judah and Samaria split. And then even after that, you have the invasions from foreign armies 
And so there are people that drift away. They either become something else or they become nothing. But there are also those who remain faithful, and that's what we mean by the faithful remnant, a small but devout group of people, some exiled, but mostly the ones that just sit there and hold vigil, really, for the return of temple practices. So that's the faithful remnant. All right, continuing with the background of Micah. The prophet Micah prophesied during a time of spiritual and moral decadence in the midst of great affluence throughout the northern and southern kingdoms. So that's both Israel and Judah. Because, And this is important for us to know too. Israel and Judah, after the schism, Israel and Judah are two separate, basically, countries. They are against each other. Okay? Sounds weird. But it, it really is almost immediately after the construction of the temple that those two great countries become separate entities. You still see glimpses of that when you get into the New Testament, you have Jesus visiting Jacob's well with the woman, the Samaritan woman. Okay, She comes from the Northern Kingdom, not the Southern Kingdom, which is Judah, which becomes Judea. Okay, all right, so anyway. Uh, mum, mum, mum. He witnessed the adoption of idolatry of the Canaanites by Samaria and Judah, so both kingdoms. Micah was born the son of Joram from the tribe of Ephraim. He prophesied to both kingdoms. Micah was known as the prophet of the poor and the herald prophet. His contemporaries were, and his contemporary prophets were, Isaiah, Amos, and Hosea. Okay, and over time, we'll take a look at all of that. Okay, and so like I said, if you have any questions, just let me know. But um, without questions, I'm just going to forge ahead. Okay, so we are in Micah again, page 1005. The word of the Lord came to Micah of Moresheth in the days of Jotham and Ahaz and Hezekiah, the kings of Judah, concerning what he saw as it relates to Samaria and Jerusalem. Hear these words, O people, give hear, heed, O earth, and all that is in it. For the Lord God shall be among you for a witness against you, the Lord from his holy house. For behold, the Lord is coming out of his place. He will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth. The mountains will shake under him, and the valleys will melt like wax before the fire like water pouring down a steep incline. All of this is for the transgression of Jacob and the sin of the house of Israel. What is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? And what is the sin of the house of Judah? Is it not Jerusalem? I will make Samaria become like a shed in the field and a vineyard for planting. And I will tear down her stones in confusion and expose her foundations. And they shall cut all of her carved images into pieces and burn down all of her houses of prostitution with fire. And I shall utterly destroy all her idols, for she gathers from the price of prostitution and has accumulated from the price of a harlot. Right, let's take a look at that real quick. No, okay. Sometimes footnotes are helpful. Sometimes they just go a different direction. Okay, so there we are, all right? Um, not a good comparison comparing Jerusalem and uh, Samaria uh, with um, a house of prostitution. On this account, on account of this, she will wail and lament. She will walk barefoot and naked, beating her breast in mourning as a serpent, and mourn as the daughter of sirens. For her calamity overwhelms her, for it has come, over Ju come to Judah, as far as to the gate of my people to Jerusalem, those of Gath. Do not exalt yourselves, and those of the house of Aphra. Do not rebuild your house from laughter. Sprinkle dust on your laughter. 
the one living in Safar, dwelling comfortably in her cities, do not come to mourn her neighbor. She will receive a calamity of grief from you. Yikes. Who has begun to do good for her who dwells in distress? For evils have come down from the Lord upon the gates of Jerusalem. Even the sound of a chariot and a horseman, those dwelling in Lashish, she was beginning to sin to the daughter of Zion. She was the beginning of sin. I'm sorry, she was the beginning of sin to the daughter of Zion. For in you were found the transgressions of Israel. Because of this, he will cause men to be sent forth as, as far as the inheritance of Gath, vain houses, for they have become vanity to the kings of Israel. Until they bring the heirs to you, O inhabitants of Lashish, an inheritance shall come far as Adalam, and even the glory of the daughter of Israel. Shave your head, and make your head bald as an eagle for the sake of your precious children. Increase your widowhood, for they have been taken captive. Okay, so we're going to stop right there for a second because we are now at chapter two and I have a question, so I will answer the question. All right, the question is, do prophets exist today or were they only just prior to Christ's coming? That is a great question, and it is a question that does not have a very definitive answer. There is a tradition within orthodoxy that states that everything before Christ was of, of prophet and everything after Christ was an apostle. They are considered two separate ranks, but... Um, according to our tradition, John, the forerunner, the one who baptized our Lord, is the very last of the prophets. Now, there are still those who speak prophecy, but there's difference between being one who speaks prophecy and one who is a prophet. Now, prophecy, I'll explain that in a second, but um, just to be, well, to try to be clear, obviously Micah is a prophet because he comes before but John is the conclusion of the prophets, and then everything after that is considered someone who is an apostle, okay? Someone who is sent out to go and preach the gospel because the prophets themselves were sent out to go and give the message of the Lord to his people. They didn't just stay in a place and just start to talk. God commanded them to go to different places and go and, pre and give this oracle to somebody, okay? So apostles and prophets are seen roughly as parallel or equal to one another. But there is clearly, just to go on the other side, there is clearly in the New Testament indications that there are people who are prophesying, okay? That are telling the word of the Lord. And so... You know, it, it, there's no good answer there. Um, but basically, we teach that they're on the one side, they're prophets, and the other side, they are apostles. And there was something else I wanted to say. That a prophet generally gets this kind of um, divine message that he is to impart. It basically, like, um, the word of the Lord came to Micah, right? The Lord um, gave him this word and compelled him to go and make this word known to everyone else. Something about prophecy. Prophecy is not foretelling the future. That is soothsaying or something like that. What prophecy is, is giving the word of the Lord to the people that are supposed to hear it. Okay, so um, Jonah says to Nineveh, you better behave or God's going to obliterate you. Okay, that is not a prophecy that is an oracle from God saying, look, shape up or you're gone. So, you know, we have to sort of think about that. When we talk about someone being prophetic today, we tend to think that they're being able to tell the future. It's, it's not like that. It's, it's, it's speaking the words that God imparted and, and doing it faithfully and correctly. That's what prophecy is all about. Okay. I just want to be clear on that. Okay, um, again, feel free to ask questions. Thank you for that question, and we will continue. All right, we are now in chapter two of Micah. Okay, they devised, okay, the sins of Judah is the caption. Chapter two, page 1005. 
They devised wickedness and were scheming evil upon their beds. And at daybreak, they put their plan into action, for they did not lift up their hands to God. Not good. They coveted fields and plundered orphans. They oppressed families and plundered a man and his house, a man in his inheritance. Therefore, says the Lord, behold, I am devising evils against this tribe from which you shall not lift up your neck, nor will you suddenly walk upright, for this is a time of evil. In that day, a parable shall be taken up against you, and a dirge will be wailed, saying, In misery we have suffered hardship. The portion of my people has been measured out with a measuring line, and there was no one who was able to stop him. Our fields have been divided among them, therefore there will be no one to put out a measuring line for a lot for you in the assembly of the Lord. Okay, so bad news. Because of their lack of righteousness, foreign oppressors are going to come and divvy everything up according to their interests and their pleasures and the people that are there will suffer. Continuing, verse six, do not shed tears nor weep over these things for he will not dismiss the reproaches who says, the house of Jacob has provoked the spirit of the Lord. Are these not his practices? Are these not his word? Are, his, are not his words good with him? And have they not proceeded as predicted and previously? For enmity, my people resisted against his peace. They flayed his skin to remove hope in the ravages of war. Therefore, those leading my people will be cast out from their luxurious homes. They have been driven out because of their wicked practices, drawn near to the everlasting mountains. And this is how oracles generally work. Because of your lack of righteousness, everything that you have will be taken from you and given to somebody else. But it doesn't stop there. It's not just the punishment. There's always this little flicker of what can be done in order to prevent these kinds of judgments from happening. So that last sentence, draw near to the everlasting mountains. It's your opportunity to save yourself if you choose to do so. However, it's up to you. If you choose to continue the path that you're following now, you do so at your own peril and you will likely suffer because of it. All right, chapter 2, verse 12. Jacob will be completely gathered together with all of them. I shall wait, expecting the remnant of Israel. By him, I will cause their return as sheep in trouble, as a flock in the midst of their fold. From the breach made before them, they will rush out from among their captors. They will break through the gate of captivity and their king comes out before their presence, and the Lord shall lead them. All right, what's being spoken of here is a reunification of Judah and Samaria. Okay, But this is in his vision. This is in his design or his wish Okay, that, that the, in the future, Jacob, which is the southern kingdom will be completely gathered together with them. And I shall be waiting, expecting the remnant of Israel, which is the northern kingdom. By him, I will cause the return as sheep in trouble. So the sheep, you know, when the sheep go off and do their own thing, then, um, but they suffer, kind of high, you know, they suffer hardships or they get attacked. Then they come running back. And okay, that's what he's saying. Um, I will cause the return of their sheep in trouble as a flock in the midst of their fold. Okay. All right. And again, if you have any questions, please feel free to let me know. Chapter 3, page 1006. He will say, Hear these things, O heads of the house of Jacob, and you remnant of Israel. Is it not for you to know judgment? You who hate good and love evil, you who seize their skins in order to flay them and to cut their flesh off their bones who devour the flesh of my people by removing their skin, breaking their bones, and dividing them as merely flesh for the cauldron and as for meat for the pot. Oh, that's horrible. 
And thus they will cry out to the Lord, but he will not hear them. Instead, he will turn his face from them at that time because they have done wickedly in their needs against themselves. Okay, a couple of things. Number one. The people who come into that area, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Persians, they had really unique and creative ways of torturing people. Of course, after a while, so did the people of the Old Covenant and even others. But the images here are meant to portray the fear and the terror that was instilled by the people who came into these lands. This was not happy time. This was horrible time. And the atrocities that were committed, there were no human rights commissions or rules of engagement. They were there to to completely crush the will of the people that were around them. And so they would use rather unique and creative ways to cause people to suffer so that they would create some form of loyalty or subjugation in amongst the people. Right, so going on. When we take a look at, um, let's see. Yeah, okay. Um, the other thing is, you can't just say, okay, I am a circumcised Jew, I'm an obedient practicer, and, um, you know, I'm being attacked, so God help me and protect me. You have to show that you are a child of God. And you do that by not just showing the outward forms of your loyalty to God through um, bodily modifications and things like that. But you also do it through the activities that you do. If you show care and preference for your neighbor, if you show mercy upon the resident alien, then God will bless you because you're doing what he wants you to do. But just because you have the outward sign, it doesn't mean a thing. He will turn his face from them at that time because they have done wickedly in their deeds against themselves. They've hurt their own people. And another point there is that we have to remember the salvation. We, we talk about our own lives and the things that we have done and how you know, we'll be judged on the account of our activities and so forth. But we are judged corporately too. Have we fulfilled as a body the expectations that God has presented to us? If we haven't, well, we have work to do, okay? Because when we hurt somebody... We're hurting our own body, hurting ourselves. All right, so that's verse four. Verse five of chapter three. Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who lead my people astray, who are proclaiming peace upon them while they themselves ate, but who, when nothing was put in their mouth, stirred up war against them. Therefore, to you, there will be darkness instead of vision. And to you, there will be darkness instead of prophecy. For the sun will set on the prophets, and the day shall come very dark on them. And the seers of dreams will be put to shame, and the prophets will be laughed and laughed to scorn. All the people will speak evil of them, because there will be no one heading, no, sorry, there will be no one heeding them. Okay? That's pretty clear. False prophets. Verse 8, surely I will strengthen myself in the spirit of the Lord and of judgment and of power to proclaim to Jacob his ungodliness and to Israel his sins. Again, you see him going after both, not just the southern kingdom, but also the northern kingdom. Indeed, hear this, you heads of the house of Jacob and the remnant of the house of Israel, you who despise judgment and are preventing everything that is upright. Excuse me, not preventing perverting everything that is upright, not polite. Let's see. Who build up Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with injustice. Her leaders make decisions founded on a bribe and her priests give answers for pay and her prophets prophesy for money. And they lean on the Lord saying, is it not the Lord that the Lord is with us? No harm can come upon us. Therefore, on account of you, Zion shall be plowed as a field. Jerusalem shall be shed in the field and the mountain or the house as a grove of trees. Brutal, 
Absolutely brutal. All right, so that's it for chapter three. And again, like I said, if you have any questions, please let me know. Verse, or chapter four. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord will be revealed. It will be raised up on the top of the mountains and it will be exalted far above the hills and peoples will hasten to it. And many nations will go there and say, come, let us go up into the mountain of the Lord to the house of God of Jacob, and they will teach us his ways and we will walk in his paths. That sounds hauntingly familiar. No, not mentioned anywhere. Okay, continuing on. And the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he will judge between many peoples and rebuke strong nations afar off. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into shields, sickles, excuse me, sickles, not shields, sickles, pruning hooks. Nation shall no more lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. But everyone shall rest, shall be at rest under his own vine and under his own fig tree. And no one shall make them afraid for the mouth of the Lord Almighty has spoken these things. All the people shall walk each one to his own way. And we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. Very powerful. Okay. And this is one of those great verses that's like found all over the place in modern writing. What are they talking about here? They are talking about a time that will come when the Lord reigns. The people of, uh, of faith that belong to him, his faithful remnant, will do the things that he expects them to do. They will be bearers of fruit. They will keep his commandments. And when they do, he will judge between many peoples and rebuke strong nations afar off. And they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. That's a beautiful image. Nations shall no longer lift up sword against nation, and neither shall they learn war any more. Oh, if only learning war. We learn war well as youngsters. All right, continuing on, we're in chapter 4, verse 6. In that day, says the Lord, I shall gather her who has been broken, and I will welcome her who has been exalted, even those whom I have rejected. And I shall make her who has been broken into a remnant and her that was rejected into a strong nation. So the Lord will reign over, sorry, over them in Mount Zion, henceforth and forever. And you, O daughter of Zion, dark to enter in, even the former kingdom. I'm sorry, try that again. And you, O daughter of Zion, dark, dark tower of the flock, on you will come. On you it will come and enter in, even the former kingdom of Babylon to the daughter of Jerusalem. And now, why have you experienced such evils? Was there no king in your midst, or did your counsel perish? For your birth pangs have seized you as one in labor. Suffer birth pains and take courage, O daughter of Zion, and draw near like a woman giving birth. For now you will be exiled from the city. And you will not abide in that flat open country. And you will come as far off as Babylon. And from that place, the Lord your God shall redeem you from the hand of your enemies. Now many nations have gathered against you, saying, We will rejoice, and our eyes will gaze upon Zion. But they do not know the thoughts of the Lord, nor perceive his counsel. For he has gathered them like sheaves on the threshing floor. Okay, threshing floor is where you separate the bad parts of a, of a stock from the fruit, like wheat. You get the wheat berries on a threshing floor. Um, you make flour and things like that in the same way. But it's a process that mimics a whipping kind of a thing. It's, it's um, and so there are images, it's like a double image. One is a good image, the other is not a good image. Okay. Arise then and thresh them, O daughter of Zion, for I shall make your hearts, or sorry, make your horns iron, and I will make your hooves bronze, and you will cause the nations to melt away, and you will winnow many peoples, and you will dedicate their abundance to the Lord and their strength to the Lord of all the earth. Now the daughter of Ephraim, 
the blockaded will be black, blockaded by a siege wall, for he ordered affliction against us, and they shall smite the tribes of Israel with a rod upon the cheek. All right, pretty clear. All right, chapter five. And you, O Bethlehem, house of Ephrathah, though you are fewest in number among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me as the one to be the ruler of Israel. His goings forth were from the beginning, even from everlasting. Therefore, he shall give them up until the appointed time for her to give birth. Then the remnant of their brothers will return with the sons of Israel. And he shall stand and see, and the shepherd of his flock, in it the strength, I'm sorry, and he shall stand and see and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord. And they will dwell in the glory of the name of the Lord their God. For now they shall be magnified unto the ends of the earth. And she will have peace. For when the Assyrian comes into our land and goes up into our country, even seven shepherds and eight attacks from men will be raised up against them. They will tend the Assyrian with a sword and the land of Nimrod in her trench. He shall deliver you from the Assyrian and he shall, and should he come into your land and should he come up over your borders. The remnant Jacob will be among the nations in the midst of many people as dew falling from the Lord and as lambs in the grass, I'm sorry, field of grass in order that none among the sons of men may assemble together nor resist. And the remnant of Job will be amongst the nations in the midst of many peoples as a lion among the cattle in the forest, as a young lion among the flock of the sheep, which, whenever it passes through, seizes and carries off its prey, and there is none to rescue. But by your hand... But your hand will be exalted above those oppressing you, and all your enemies will be completely cut off. Okay, I'm going to continue. And it shall come to pass on that day, says the Lord, that I shall utterly destroy your horses from your midst and destroy your chariots. And I shall utterly destroy the cities of your land and demolish all your strongholds. And I shall drive away your sorceries out of your hands, and there shall be no soothsayers among you. I shall utterly destroy your carved images and the sacred pillars in your midst, and you will no longer worship the work of your hands. And I shall cut off your sacred groves from the midst and destroy your cities, and I shall exact, exact vengeance on the nations with wrath and anger among those who did not heed." Oh my goodness, there's a lot going on here. But basically what he's saying in different words and in different connotations. One second. Is that our God is a jealous God. He does not put up with idolatry. And what is going on is you have a whole group of people that are beginning to worship vain things. Doesn't matter what they are. It could be a local God. It could be anything. And what's going to happen is that God is going to come through and he's going to smash these carved idols. He's not going to put up with the idolatry. He's going to destroy it all. So it's important for us to understand that what we are dealing with there is a country that is obsessed with something other than God. All right, we'll talk about this a little bit more towards the end. It's a uh, we have some time, so I'm going to keep going, but I want us to keep that little seed in our head that the pursuits that the people are, per are pursuing, you know, first of all, the major first problem is that there is a, um, um, a division between the North and the South, which has weakened them. They're fighting each other and not like physically fighting, but sometimes they are, but they're really at odds with each other. And so they're not building each other up. They're tearing each other down which means that they're making each other susceptible to foreign invasion, you know, because they're not working together, they're working against each other. So that's a problem because God expects his people 
and I don't mean just the whole world, the, the Goyim, he means the Am Arwe, the, the Am, Am Yahweh, the people of God. He means for them to stick together. You know, united we stand, divided we fall. Well, here we are in classic and very vivid um, demonstration. Okay. Let's see. So it's important, again, for us to think about that in those terms. God smashes idols, but he also wants very much for people to be united, these two kingdoms. Following him, of course, not just united just to be together, but being loyal subjects to God. All right. The case against Israel. This is chapter 6. Now hear the word of the Lord, the Lord says. Arise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, O mountains, the judgment of the Lord, and you valleys, its foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a case against his people, and he will contend with Israel. My people, what have I done to you? Oh, my people, what have I done to you? How have I grieved you? Answer me, for I brought you up out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of bondage. And I sent you Moses and Aaron and Miriam. Oh, my people, remember now what King Balak of Moab plotted against you and what answer Balaam, the sons of Beor, gave to him from the reeds as far as to Gilgal, that righteousness of the Lord might be. That, that the righteousness of the Lord God might be known. How shall I then come to understand the Lord and devote myself to the Most High God? How shall I reach him with burnt offerings, with year-old calves? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with a myriad of streams of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my ungodliness, the fruit of my own body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O man, what is good, or what does the Lord seek from you but to do justly and to love mercy and to be ready to walk humbly with the Lord your God? You're getting the idea here, I think. The Lord's voice shall be proclaimed in the city, and he shall save those who fear his name. Hear, O tribe, who will put the city in order, for there is not a fire there. And the house of the lawless storing up lawless treasures with insolent unrighteousness? Will the lawless be justified by a balanced scale or a bag of deceitful weights from which they accumulated their ungodly wealth? And those who dwell in the city have spoken lies and exalted themselves with their own mouth. Therefore, I will begin to smite you and I will destroy you because of your sins. You shall eat, but not be satisfied, and there will be darkness upon you, and he will depart without being noticed, and you will not be rescued. All who do escape will be given over to the sword. You will sow, but you will not reap. You will press olives, but you will not anoint yourselves with oil. And you will make wine, but you will not drink any of it. And the statutes of my people will be utterly abolished. For you have kept the ordinance of Omri and done all the works of the house of Ahab. You have walked in their councils, so I should deliver you over, so that I should deliver you over to the complete destruction and make your inhabitants into a hissing, and you will bear the reproach of the peoples. Okay. Do we have any questions? All right, I'm going to continue on. Woe is me, for I have become like one harvesting stubble, like one gleaning small grapes after the vintage grapes are picked, but not finding for myself any clusters of first fruit to eat. Woe is me, O my soul, for the God-fearing man has perished from the earth, and there is no one upright among the men. They all lie in wait, even unto blood, and each one grievously opposes his oppresses his neighbor. They prepare their hands for evil. The prince demands a gift, and the judge speaks flattering words. It is the desire of their souls. Thus I shall take away their good things, 
as the moth who eats away, and the one proceeding by the rule of the day of the watch. Alas, alas, for the time of your vengeance is come. Now shall be their lamentation. Do not trust in friends, nor put your hope in those who govern. Beware of your wife and do not tell her anything. For a son dishonors his father and a daughter will rise up against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies are all the people of his own house. Okay, we're going to stop there for a minute. I think actually we'll stop there for good. And I just want to revisit some of the things that are going on here. If we can go on, we will, but I don't think we're going to make it to the end. So it just seems reasonable to kind of pause for a second. What is going on here? I'll tell you what's going on. In Micah, what we have are two nations that are convinced that they are God's chosen people, both of them. They think that because they have some kind of national identity, they can go about and do whatever it is that they want because God is on their side. They feel that they are righteous compared to everyone else, the nations, even each other. And they don't even care for the least of their own citizenry. They like their, their poshness. They like their affluence. They seek after wealth. And they already have wealth. So they're building wealth upon wealth upon wealth. And not only that, but they are also looking for ways to increase their wealth by going after small little countries around them and taking all their stuff. So what's ending up happening is that the leadership is corrupt and the people themselves, not the remnant, but the people themselves are turning to idols and they're doing things that are completely and totally displeasing to God. I've already spoken about how the split of the kingdom was a big problem. But even once they split the kingdom, neither side is really doing anything other than seeking its own enrichment, its own material success. So what Micah is saying is that God is going to do really horrible things to them. And he's going to do it in justice because they themselves are showing no justice to anybody else. So what's going to happen is these foreign powers are going to come in and they're going to do all these horrible things like we've already described. The foreign powers will come and they will drive the people into utter desolation. They'll, some will be exiled. Some will be put to death. Some will be enslaved. I mean, all these different things will happen. And the rulers themselves, um, especially the, the major rulers, they'll be put to death and their families sold into slavery. It's a very ugly issue, you know, a very ugly image. And we sit here and say, well, how can God do this? Well, I mean, the problem is that people have chosen to betray God through their activities, through the things that they have chosen to do. They're no longer his people. They think that they are. They think that they're, you know, because of their circumcisions and because of their outward appearances and their practices of sacrifice and so forth. They feel that they are God's chosen people, but they're not because they don't live into what God expects of them to do. What is it that they expect? What does the Lord seek from you? It says again in Micah chapter six, verse eight. What is he saying? Do justly, love mercy, and be ready to walk with the Lord your God. Okay, let me see. Excuse me, one second. Uh, I don't know if I can reach this without making it fall on the ground. Another Bible. I want to find that translation here. By the way, this book that I have in my hand, the new Oxford Annotated Bible Revised Standard Edition, this has a version of the Revised Standard that was finished in 1973 and is probably the best Bible in English that's out there. Okay, so I highly recommend this. It's still available in print. And let me be really clear. It is not the new Revised Standard version. It is the Revised Standard version. Now I realize we also have the Orthodox Study Bible, and I'm not going to pick on that too much, but I do think it's very good for us to have multiple translations. 
And I think this one is the best of them all. All right, so let's find Micah. There's 1123. I'm getting close to the end here. 1123. Oops. Oh, 1123. Duh, my 1023. Sorry. Okay, and we are at six and eight. Of course, if you looked at um, this version, I'll show you in a second. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? I would put that on your refrigerator, okay? What does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? I mean, what a beautiful image, isn't it? That's what God expects of us, not to seek after our own glory, not to wallow in our righteousness and say, look, God loves us. So we're just going to go and do whatever it is that we want to do. If we want to show that we are truly God's people, and we can say this as a people, as a church, as a nation, we need to do these things. Okay. It's totally biblical. All right. Now I want to show you something. Okay. If you look, um, this is poetry. It is not prose. Okay, each one of those lines, and that's how you can tell the difference. But that's in the RSV. This is in the um, Orthodox Study Bible. Now, that is an Orthodox translation of that, but the poetics have been taken out. Okay, and there are reasons for it. One of them is the difference between Greek and Hebrew, but it's, it's still important to know that there is a poetic aspect to all of this in the original Hebrew. And, it's worth looking at. Okay, so um, so you get the gist of what's going on here, okay? A nation that is convinced of its own righteousness, okay, because they consider themselves God's chosen people. And God is speaking to the prophet Micah and saying, you need to tell these people who think that they are God's chosen people that all sorts of grief is coming their way because they think they are, but they are not. OK, and that's when you get the swords will be beaten into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks and um, and nations shall not lift sword against nation and neither shall they learn war anymore. All of those kinds of things are part of what is truly a nation that is embracing what God wants them to do. It is not a country that wallows or revels in military superiority. It is not a country that thinks it is right because it wins all its battles. Because the battles that we're fighting, it was fighting, were pitched battles, okay? And yes, I am intentionally making a parallel between then and now, okay? These are things that we always must be mindful of. God has expectations for his people that we are bearers of fruit and we need to make sure that we are doing that in a way that is pleasing to God, not in a way that makes us prosperous in the world. God doesn't care about that. He doesn't care what's happening in the world. He cares about us being the bearers of fruit to be the apostles that we are called to be. So there we are. All right. So that's good for today. Um, we will continue with the conclusion of Micah and then we'll move on to another book of the Bible. If you have a thought on a book of the Bible that you would like to go over, please feel free to let me know in a comment or an email or a text. I'd be happy to deal with that. And um, as always, if there is any other question that you have, I'd be more than happy to answer them. So thank you again for spending your hour with me. I'm grateful that you're here with me. God bless you and your family always. And God willing, we'll see you again real soon, Thursday night. God bless you. Have a good day.